what I'm going to do is introduce um, our moderator today, who is also the uh, Hapa.me creator and photographer, Kip Fullback. Um, Janima has a very special relationship with Kip. We've been working with him for a very long time now for um, a couple of ex um, shows that we've had prior to this one. Um, and in fact, 15 years ago, um, in 2006, we had um, the first variant of the Hapa.me show, which was called uh, Part Asian 100% Hapa, which he um, put together. So this show is kind of a part two of that, and I'm sure he'll talk more about it when he comes up. But um, he's going to be our moderator, and then he he will introduce us to our two panelists. So, Kip Fulbeck. Kind of a moderator, but I'm really just, they said they want to do a panel of Hopper writers, and I'm like, I know two that I really want. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I get to share the stage with two of my idols, so I get stoked on that. I have a bio for each of these guys, which is just, you know, a gabillion things they've done, but I think you already know who they are. So, I'll tell you my relationship with them. Um, they're both friends, they're both mentors, they're uh, incredible writers. Um, Jamie Ford's, you know, his breakthrough book, Hotel, I mean, made me feel like I wasn't a writer when I read it, which is a compliment. So, so uh, it's been translated into like, I think, 20,000 languages, is that right? It's like 20,000 and then it's, and you know, it's gonna be a movie, it's, it's, you know, it's looking at a musical, it's just so forth and so on. So I can read you more about him, but I think, you know, and let's, let's bring in Jamie Ford. <laughs> And then uh, many, many years ago, when I first started getting involved with uh, Hapa Issues, uh, there was fortunately one pioneer in LA who had already started things, and that was Valina, who has written, I got at least 30 plays, I think probably more, have been translated in also 20 million languages, uh, distinguished professor at USC, I mean, founder of graduate studies in playwriting, et cetera, et cetera. Please welcome Valina Hasu Houston. So what we thought we'd do is I'll just ask them a couple fun questions and then let you guys ask questions here. And rather than the usual, how did you start writing things, um, I, I'm more interested in, in sort of the meat and potatoes. And if it's okay with you guys, I'll just speak off the cuff. Like, oh, you know, I think of you guys as great writers. And then there's subset of your great Asian Pacific American writers and subset your great Hapa writers. But I don't list Hapa first. Um, when did you guys first figure out that you guys were like part of this subgroup that we're in. <laughs> um, you know, I, I grew up, uh, and I, it's, it's a common theme with anyone that's Hapa, I'm sure you sort of grew up with one foot in two different worlds or three different worlds or four different worlds. And you struggle for identity as you grow up. And it was, it was weird for me, because my dad was Chinese, my mom was Caucasian, and in the 60s and the 70s, like the only, the really the only Chinese guys that I knew of that had white wives was my dad and Bruce Lee, and, I, and that was kind of nice company, honestly. Um, but it really wasn't until I moved to Hawaii, and there everybody's hapa, everyone's mixed, everyone's everything, that I finally felt comfortable in my own skin, um, and you know, Hapa became part of my identity. Hello, everybody. Did I do it right? Okay. Can you hear me? Great. Um, I think that I always understood from the very beginning, well, I know I did, that I, I was in different worlds. Because when we, uh, I, I was born on international waters outside of Japan, stateless, as it were. Um, but uh, because I was on a U.S. military ship, which was U.S. property, um, I was um, given the birthplace of my father's first assignment. So I grew up in Kansas, and I saw uh, there were 700 Japanese immigrant women in Kansas at the time. So kind of like Hawaii, all of my friends had a Japanese mother and a father who was something else. <laughs> and so for me, that was a normalized identity. And my mother laughed because when I went to kindergarten in Kansas, I said to her, you're not going to believe this, but there are families where the parents are the same color. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. OK, see, these guys are good, right? All right, second question here is, I want to know, as writers, how you tap in, how much you tap into your real life experience for you know, your creative impulse. And, and I have two particular uh, examples. Jamie and Hotel, like the relationship between K 
Keiko, if you guys haven't read it, and, and, and Henry's parents, that tenuous relationship of, of for, for people looking outside, I remember being going to a wedding once, it was Ed Park's wedding. Ed Park was marrying Reiko, and, and they were both faculty. Ed Park's Korean American, Reiko Japanese American. To anyone walking by outside, there was 400 Asians having a good time in the wedding. To anyone inside, there were 200 Japanese, 200 Koreans that hated each other. Okay, uh, the older generation, it was a lot of tension. A younger crew, we were all okay. But I think from the outside, we don't notice this. I think you capture this, this tension between the, the Japanese-Chinese conflict in ways that were, were really resonant to me, because I remember like the first time I dated a Japanese-American woman, mom was cool. I dated a woman from Japan once and mom iced her, because she was just not okay. Where she's okay with me showing at the Japanese-American National Museum. But if I was to show in Japan, it'd be a different thing. So that's an example for you. And then for Lena, I noticed like what you're tapping into, especially in tea, which seeing that changed my life the first time I saw it. Um, the relations of, of like, like uh, Atsuko and Chizue, you know, this, this idea that, that the difference between like doing what is your duty versus doing what you want to do for you, the individualism, I feel like you really sense that comes through in your work so many times. And I'm wondering for you too, how much do you pull out of your own lives for those topics? Immigrant. Okay, so um, I think with T, I felt that with a lot of those women, there are five Japanese immigrant women characters in T, and um, one is married to a Japanese American, the others are married to Mexican American, African American, different races of people. So um, that individualism comes through because Atsuko is the character who married a Japanese American and she felt that it was the right thing to do that if she was going to marry an American, he should be of Japanese descent and that would be okay with her parents, although of course it was not and <laughs> because it was the wrong side of, uh, of uh, it was an Axis. It was an allied power person versus Japan being Axis powers um, versus people who made choices that were different like the character of Chizue, she chose to marry, well she didn't choose to marry, but she married a Mexican American because she loved him and so it was individualistic choice. Uh, my own father is African American, was, was African American, Native American and Cuban, my mom is Japanese and um, I feel that uh, in my own writing it's not that I, I exactly create characters that are that ethnic mixture, but I do look across different monoracial groups and I don't see or feel the borders that, that many people in those groups sense as they're going through life. And so I feel that when characters make decisions, that while sometimes making those kinds of decisions across you know, these supposed borders can create friction and tension, um, I say, Bring it on. And, uh, and my sister is married to a Chinese American. And when they first got married, this is actually, I, I adapted the play, Little, the novel Little Women, into a play that is Japanese, Chinese, African American, and Mexican American. Uh, that actually, I don't know if I can say this, Elizabeth, but, uh, but uh, they're going to be doing it, doing it around Christmas time here. But um, what I wanted to say is that I feel that. Uh, and, I put, and I t I'm telling you this because I put this story into Little Women, which was shocking to my brother-in-law. And this is the story. <laughs> when he married my sister, he put a container on the counter and labeled it Chinese rice. Because I think a lot of you know that Chinese rice is different from Japanese rice. <laughs> okay. And my sister looked at it, and it really bugged her. And so she filled a container with Japanese rice, and she put a label on it that said, Real rice. <laughs> <laughs> so you do pull from your real life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie? Um, yeah, I, I definitely draw from, from my experience, my dad's experience, my grandparents' experience in a, an attempt to understand them. And also I like uh, going back in time and writing historical fiction and, and listening to the cultural heartbeat of the time and to see how different it was or how similar it was. Um, in my family, in, in hotel, the character of Henry is, you know, he, he expresses on the page what we now would call, you know, uh, filial piety. Um, back then, it was just, you know, obeying your parents. And in a in a modern context, I think it's it's a gross generalization to say this, but a lot of teenagers feel that their parents owe them everything. And I grew up in a household where you were taught that you owe your parents everything, and so that character emotes uh, a lot of that. Um, and then there are, there are side characters that are just moments and glimpses and vignettes of uh, things that 
I sometimes I write because I don't have answers to questions because relatives have passed away, and so I try to explore the context of their lives, and then in fiction try to try to solve those problems. Um, but there's always cultural baggage baked into everything. And when I lived in Hawaii, I had a coworker who was Chinese, and she married again mar married a Japanese man, and her parents refused to attend the wedding. This was 1993, not 1943. So there, there is a generation of people that still hold on to that cultural baggage, and I find that uh, tragic and interesting. Thank you. Now, both of your work has been used in schools, um, secondary, college, graduate. Um, both of you guys have legions of fans. Rather than sort of hear those stories, are there ones, responses from fans that particularly stand out to either of you guys? I remember, you had, you, like the post, if you had that woman with the, with the Post-its, things like that. I mean, do you hear hear stories of like? I mean, I can I know like the, my top five fan reactions ever. You know, can I hear some from you guys? Uh, yeah, let me call one up. <laughs> this was this was a, a recent one. Uh, if you'll just indulge me, because uh, someone was asking me this, and I was like, I don't think it gets uh, any better than this. Um, I mean, I've had some really touching reactions, but this one just just cracked me up. Um, and <laughs> this is. Sorry, I'm just scrolling forever. Um, please ignore. Okay, I'm going to have to take a moment to find this. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> just reactions from fans or, or reactions to your work. Well, I have interesting reactions to my work because sometimes, I'm, I mean, the, with the advent of the internet, people can Google me and find out what I look like. But in early days, uh, and particularly with certain generations of people, they didn't Google what I looked like. So I would go to Japan, and there would be a reading of a play or this. And I remember once I met uh, a woman had come from China, because apparently tea is, is read uh, throughout China. It's been translated to Mandarin and Cantonese. And the woman came from China to meet me in Japan. And uh, we were standing in the train station. And she kept looking at me. But she was looking for somebody who looked different than I do. <laughs> And so it was very funny. So finally, as the crowd thinned out, I walked over to her and I said, hello. And I said, I'm Valina. She goes, you're Valina? And I said, yes. And she said, oh, I was expecting, you know, a 50-year-old Japanese lady. And I said, <laughs> I said well, uh, I interpret the word Japanese differently than you do. <laughs> That's very gracious. So, <laughs> so that was very interesting. Um, I, I've had some very touching moments. Uh, one was a book event where uh, a woman had read uh, my first book to her father, who was in the Minidoka uh, camp, and read it to him while he was in hospice. And it was a subject that he had never been able to talk about. And it brought them a lot of uh, solace in that moment. But I also get just uh, feedback from students. And this, is, this was uh, Sunday. I got this from an eight... Uh, uh, an eighth grader in New Hampshire. And she says, Dear Jamie Ford, the book Hotel in the Corner of Bitter and Sweet was a really good book, so up, unt up until page 369. You <laughs> sick, twisted bitch, I hate you. Why, Jay, why? Why you do this to me? Why you make me cry in the car on the way to zip lining? Why the fuck would you do that to all the people who were forced to read this shitty book? At first I hated the book, and then Keiko and Henry made me almost sort of tolerate this, but then you had to put in Ethel, that backstabbing witch, and I swear she's a show stealer. This book was not supposed to end like that. The book broke my heart. It was not supposed to end that way. It broke my heart like the way when my lizard died. Do you know how much, <laughs> do you know how much uh, I died when my lizard died? Try almost actually dying. So the only way to make up to me is to make sure that Henry and Keiko end up together and have awesome Chinese and Japanese babies. Please don't be offended that I'm being mean. This is just my opinion. So, um, that is awesome. That's the best review ever. That, is, that needs to go on the back of the book. That like, is. Why you make me cry on the way to zip lining? I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's still good, though. It's still a good review, though. Oh, it's, to it's totally honest. And I love visiting schools. And the more, like, I visit some schools that are like, you know, like, like an elite baccalaureate private school and the kids all have ties and they're very buttoned up and they don't have very, uh, you know, their, their, their feedback is very filtered. And I like more uh, inner city schools or normal public schools because then kids are like that and you just get the raw intensity of the beauty of who they are at that moment. I love yeah, it's it. more organic and visceral, yeah. it's real. I remember the worst time I ever got for my, my film, Nine Fish, was about my grandmother in a nursing home in hospice and one reviewer wrote, um, 
rendered almost unwatchable by babbling voiceover which reeks of theatrical self-indulgence. And I thought, God, that is so, they had it took a long time to write that. You know, that's a, wow. like, you've got to really hate it. And so I, I, I excerpted that and put it on the back of my DVD. And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> with his name. And I, when it was online, I hyperlinked him too. But it's like, you've you got to appreciate stuff like that. I think it's because it's the only thing they were writing. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I have one more question for you guys. And um, this is because I know you. Uh, both of you guys are kind of really gutsy in terms of the chances you'll take. And and speaking out on things you believe in. And, uh, you know, like you guys know that Crazy Rich Asians originally wanted to cast the Constance Wu character as Caucasian, and, you know, and that was the original version, and to their credit, they said, no, we're not gonna do that. Um, I mean, Jamie has a story about that with Hotel, and, um, but it's not that, it's like, it's you, know, you speaking out at that prep school and calling people out for their privilege, and, and, and just being, and saying things that are not gonna go over well, but are very honest, that are so needed in this time because I teach university and no one wants to say anything real because everyone's afraid of offending people. We have this victim Olympics. And you know, and it's like, who is more oppressed? And, like, and then so we go, like, okay, okay, okay. And then we like shut up and no one talks about it. And then we elect Trump, because you know, we're not talking about anything. And so I, I, I look at Valina and you're willing to call out like the intra-racism within HAPA, which no one talks about. Everyone thinks, oh, you HAPAs all get along well. You all find not even close. Um, and you're also willing to put out like that beautiful blog piece you wrote about like who gets to use what word and call identity. And you are just so gutsy in putting out there. And I think both of you guys take these chances that I kind of always feel checked when I look at you. I'm like, I got to speak out more about that. How do you guys manage that when the fallout and how do you have the guts to do it? Uh, uh, well, well it, it helps to have good friends. Um, and and, and I, I say that because I did that thing in Highland Park, Texas. Uh, you can Google Jamie Ford in Highland Park, Texas, and you'll you'll see it all. Um, and that generated, it went viral. It generated a lot of t attention, um, in a good way. But it also had you know people calling me chink and threatening me, and parents wanting to kill me, and all this fun stuff. Um, and in the middle of that chaos, uh, some person you might know uh, named Kip Fulbeck called me and is like, what do you need, man? What do you need? You need to kick someone's ass? You need moral support? You need to vent? What do you need? This is rock and roll time. Let's do this. And so it, it helps to have friends that uh, understand uh, the chances you're taking. And um, I'm never afraid to punch up. I mean, that never feels wrong, even though you're likely to get slammed. And you know that's a that's a that's a noble fight, and that's worth undertaking. And but writers are super sensitive people, and so to have a, a big group of people suddenly think you're the antichrist, that's never fun. You know, you kind of have to just grit your teeth and get through that. But um, but that's using your superpowers for good. That's what you're supposed to do, I think, as a responsibility. And I, it drives me crazy because I I have some author friends that are you know, very successful authors, and they're just walking this razor's edge of not offending anybody in our current political climate. And I just don't, I, I don't abstain. I'm not a fence sitter. I don't know how to do that. And um, when I, my first job out of college, I worked for the Bainbridge Review, and it's a newspaper outside of Seattle. And our editor came in with this little old man who was the original editor of the review, and he was so excited because his name was um, uh, uh, Walt. Wood I was going to say Bob Woodward. It's Walt Woodward, and he was going to write a column for us. And he and he's so excited. And I'm right out of college. I don't know anything. I don't know why I should know or care about this man. And he pulls me aside, and he's like, "This is the only man in America who was writing editorials, you know, from the newspaper's point of view, against the Japanese internment." in the face of treason charges. And they were gonna come in and basically arrest him. And he's like, treason it is, and just kept on doing it. And I shook his hand, and I tell people, I, I live to be worthy of that handshake. About the, care, about the roles of uh, the film adaptation. <laughs> the that, that's, the, that's the, the film, my, my first film agent, um, she's super nice. I hope she's not here, we're in LA. Um, <laughs> She, she's super nice, but she was just trying to be straight with me. She said, I love this book. It's, I'm going to sell the film option in a heartbeat, and it's never going to get made because your main characters are Chinese, Japanese, and black. Um, and I was like, oh, that sucks. Um, 
And then I had a bunch of meetings in Hollywood, and everyone was very excited about the book because it did really well. And I had three meetings with producers, and they said the, this exact quote. They said, how do we mitigate the financial risk without a white male lead? And so I fired my film agent, and uh, I just didn't settle for uh, changing my main character's ethnicity um, to white, which is what they wanted to do right, at every turn. It was so depressing. Um, and I honestly, I just told myself internally, I'd like this book will never get made into a film in my lifetime. I just gave up on that hope or dream. And I, I just like to write books. If it becomes a movie, cool, but it's not really my goal. But things started to progress and move along. And there was that big moment at the Oscars. And then they, they, they added people of color to the Academy. And they added a, a steering committee on diversity to the Academy. And then there's a movie called Crazy Rich Asians and Black Panther and, and things that, that show that uh, this can be a success. And so I have, I have hope. Um, not great hope, because Hollywood is still kind of a weird sausage factory. But um, it's possible now. Um, well, you know, I believe that uh, being born as I have been born ethnically, that it was almost a sort of unspoken obligation that I look between the cracks. And being one of the, the pioneers of the HAPA movement here in the United States, uh, I, worked, I was working with Teresa Williams, who's Japanese and white, and Phil Tajitsu Nash, who's Japanese-American and white. And uh, for us, it was interesting talking about the fissures in the HAPA identity, because uh, often, my students, I teach at USC, my students will say, uh, well, you know, there's a white American master narrative. And I say, well, you know, there's also an African American master narrative, an Asian American master narrative, and a Latino American master narrative. And a female. <laughs> and the hop, yes, absolutely. And the Hapa one really fell between the cracks. And what made it more complicated for me it was, uh, the, is that I was not a Hapa who was Asian and white, but I was a Hapa person uh, who's ancestry also included African descent. And this has always made it harder for me, particularly uh, being of Japanese culture. And then, I mean, I remember long ago when I first came to LA riding on a bus, lots of Japanese Americans and myself, and there was a white woman on the bus who was trying to find out what the name of this Japanese product was. And I knew what it was, but I knew that if I said that, she would look at me as if I wasn't an authentic source. So. <laughs> So I just waited and waited, and then finally, as I was getting off the bus, I said, you know, this is what you're looking for. And she goes, how do you know that? You know? And it's those. And when I was a graduate student at UCLA, my, my um, advisor said to me, I was writing T, which has five Japanese female characters in it, and he said, um, you know, you really should write for a wider audience. And the fan was going in his office, so I said, did you say W-I-D-E-R or W-H-I-T-E-R? And he just looked at me and shook his head. He goes, oh, Valina. He goes, if anything, at least make all of their husbands Japanese or Japanese-American or Asian-Americans won't want to accept your narrative either. Wow. And my response really is, I don't care because I'm not writing for a certain audience. I'm writing to tell stories that I think are important to me. And if they're populated with people who are of different Asian American ethnicities or who are African American or who are Mexican American or Cuban American, whatever they are, um, it's, the, it's the narrative, the story that I have to tell. And I don't say to myself, well, this character should really be white or this character should really be this. I simply say this is a story I have to tell. And sometimes, you know, yes, you must rely on your friends in order to you know, balance uh, the tenets of sanity in our society. Um, but other times, you really just have to muster that courage and uh, move forward. And sometimes it means that, yes, you will be thought of as the Antichrist or, or whatever. But I mean, I think that for any writer writing in his or her time, whenever it was, I'm sure that you know, whether it was religion or whatever the difference was, it bumped up against somebody's nerves. And they said, oh, I don't like that. Today, we have internet trolls to tell you what they don't like every single second of the day. Um, uh, please don't read any of that. <laughs> but, but the reality is, I think that artists are writing from a certain source. And sometimes it means that you have to uh, walk through a, a minefield. And I guess for me, being what I am, that's always been OK for me, because I've always been between the narratives of different races and ethnicities, and certainly uh, not part of the narrative, the dominant narrative here in this society, but that hasn't stopped me. I, I was once uh, at the, in the casting office at the Mark Taper Forum, 
and if there's somebody who works for them, I'm sorry, but it's a true story. Um, and we were doing a reading of a play of mine that had several characters that were mixed race Asian. And the casting director was looking over the casting list and she looked at me and she threw her hands up in the air and she said, Valina, how do you expect me to find people like this? And these were people who were Chinese and white, Japanese and white, Japanese and black. And I, I was just stunned at that response. And all I could think of is, you are one of the major theaters in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> you know, I said, you need to be up on these things. You should, you don't tell me how can I find them. You go out and start, start looking for them. And that, for me, you know, you were talking earlier about Hollywood, that falls into that notion of um, we looked but we couldn't find them or nobody like this exists. And so then you end up with, you know, uh, Emma Stone playing uh, a Hoppa sure. girl in, in Aloha. <laughs> Uh, because I and guess Tom Cruise has the last samurai. <laughs> yes, because there's nobody else. So I understand what Jamie was saying about you know the business. It's the same in theater too. I mean, in theater and in fiction, there are many narratives where Asian Americans and other people of color are the central you know characters in these stories and these narratives. But um, but in Hollywood, that isn't the case. Particularly with you know uh, Hollywood blockbuster movies. I mean, that simply isn't the case. I'm a little bit hopeful that maybe it's moving in a different direction, but I also, I also think it's important to support, to, to read books, to please go to the theater and, um, and to look at independent films, which often explore narratives that do have characters who um, are a little bit different than, than what we've traditionally known out of Hollywood. And the fact that you guys are here supporting this museum and a panel like this, you know, thank you guys. And thank you to my friends here. You know, I love you guys and I'd like to open it up to uh, Questions from the audience, if you guys have any questions for these two amazing writers. <laughs> Groovy. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I was always actually leaning back and forth uh, between, you know, Japanese-American side and that side where I was just sort of actually wondering. I mean, my other half is incredibly, like, very mixed. It's like Mexican, Lithuanian, Welsh. It's confusing, really. Um, anyway, so how do you how do you actually actually navigate that sort of um, field. I mean, just sort of trying to actually really realize um, the sort of identity of a narrative um, when it comes to actually writing book, books like books and films like these. Because um, you know, because I always actually find that a lot of my writing actually tends to reflect um, Japanese narratives and, but also actually question characters' identities, uh, who they are, um, when even I don't even know. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that everybody is always questioning their identities. I mean, my husband, who's sitting behind you, is from England. <laughs> you know, he's, you know, he is, you know, from the point of view of this society, a white male, and people will say, oh, well, you know, he's a white male, so he must understand. But, you know, he's questioning his identity, too. But that's why I think that as a writer, and it seems like you're going to be writing creative fiction, that, that uh, you know, I feel that you have to follow your instincts, and the characters that you want to foreground and the stories that you want to tell, I think you need to pursue that. And if, I mean, for instance, I'm you know, very mixed, but a lot, of people, a lot of people say to me, um, well, in fact, there was a professor in Japan once, Japanese, who said to me, uh, you know, Valina, I just don't like American blacks. And I looked at him and I said, well, you know, professor, I'm you know, of African ancestry. I said, so I think it's a little odd that you would say that to me. And uh, he said, no, 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 you're half Japanese, you're different. And uh, I said, no, uh, that's, <laughs> that is not how we're going to let this go down. <laughs> so, you know, we had a long talk about it. It was interesting, right? And so if he thinks of my narratives, he thinks, well, she's writing a lot about Japanese immigrants. And so therefore, she is supporting the Japanese culture. And so that's that, you know. But, but the reality is, I didn't sit, sit down and say, OK, I'm going to write about Japanese female immigrants in America. I often do because that's my mother's history, and it's part of the world that I know and embrace. But I think with you, you know, with anybody, that, that you, you have to, to pursue the characters and stories that are of interest to you, and that will give you the, it will fuel it with the passion needed to bring them to life in meaningful ways that will have an impact on people regardless of race, of, you know, regardless of the race or ethnicity of the reader, so. Uh, um, uh, it I think it was Colson Whitehead who said, all stories are either about where we're from or where we're going. 
And I, there's some truth to that. And I think everyone in this room, all of us, we all have a certain point of view. You have a point of view that's unique to you. And for some people, that point of view is, you know, the insularity of their experience is like, I'm a single mom, that's my point of view. Or I'm retired, that's my point of view. Or I bombed out of medical school, that's my point of view. Or for some people, your, self, your identity is a blending of ethnicities or a blending of cultures or a blending of uh, socioeconomic dynamics. And that's your point of view. And, and write what's interesting to you take ownership of it, and also don't be afraid to turn it over and look at the ugly side of it too, because there's, there's good and bad to all of those things. And so for me, I just, I, it's, it's just a, it feels really self-indulgent to write things that are about uh, Asian American culture, because I'm interested in that. You know, I could write science fiction or, or cozy mysteries or something like that, but I feel like I'm just writing what's interesting to me, and I'm lucky that we have a, a, a moment in our culture where other people are, are kind of interested in getting out of their lanes and reading about you know, someone's experience growing up in Iran or Afghanistan or something like that. I think for you know, decades, centuries, our literature and our entertainment all was Eurocentric, and everything else was the lesser. And I don't know if it's because we've tapped out of all those stories or because, you know, it's just like imagine eating, you know, pot roast every meal. At some point, you're going to want a taco or you're going to want sushi. And I think we're doing that with entertainment. I think it's just a, we're maturing as a society and, and willing to partake of other people's experiences, which I think, um, as a writer, I consider myself as someone in the compassion creation business. And I think learning and reading about someone else's experience creates empathy and creates compassion and makes the world literally a better place. Let's see one there. Um, hi, um, so I'm a, a mixed girl, but not Asian mixed. I'm, I'm black and white. I'm ethnically ambiguous is what we say in, in our household. Um, but all of my nephews are are um, Hapa or Hafujin. Um, they're all they're all half Okinawan. Um, I lived in Japan for a long time, so I sort of feel a little bit Hapa. Uh, before we lived in Japan, I was cast while in elementary school to play Hojon, the little Korean boy, in Mash. Um, yeah, um, but I struggled, especially before we were in Okinawa, about being half. I didn't I didn't know that I was really for a long time. It wasn't something we talked about. And Kip asked early on about your experiences as young people and sort of interacting in a singular ethnic um, culture. And um, I was surprised, Valeda, and excited to hear that you had, I think because of the military association, that, that experience that I had once I was out of the United States. Um, Jamie, I'm curious, and Kip, you too, um, how did you navigate that world? I, you know, I came in today thinking about like cousins or, or family, like, you know, my cousins weren't like me. Um, so how did you navigate that and how did you, um, within your family, how did you speak about it? Was it something that was talked about? Go ahead, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in my family, it was, you know, I'm, my, my ancestor came over in 1865, and so my grandfather, you know, was a, a U.S. citizen by birth, uh, thanks to uh, the 14th Amendment. Um, and so we've been here for a while. My family's been here 20 years longer than Donald Trump's family, you know, we're, we're American. Um, and so I think there was another generation that blazed the path and suffered the consequences um, before I ever arrived on the scene. And so I like writing about those experiences. My, my grandmother had my father out of wedlock in 1929, Chinese woman. And so, she, I mean, she's, a, you know, an unwed mother, was like a social pariah, but she's also Asian and she's, you know, she's a, a minority within a minority. And so I try to draw from that. Uh, growing up myself, I was just, it's weird, I hate to say it, but we kind of self-segregate. We find people that look like us. Um, and in grade school, there was a half Japanese boy. And I was half Chinese. And we just naturally became friends. And we, we didn't even think about it. Years later, we look back and go like, oh, I guess, you know, we, we, we both had families that cooked rice. And, and, and we ate weird things. And we kind of do that. And that gives you comfort in high school. I, I was comfortable enough just being 
different, even though I went to a very predominantly Caucasian high school. Um, you know, I, I drove a, a, my first car was a yellow Honda Civic, and I, I called it the Yellow Peril. You know, <laughs> you, just, you just, just take ownership of those things and, and be proud of it. Well, I grew up half hour from here in LA County. It was addressed up Covina, but it was just, we were just unincorporated LA County by Cal Poly where my dad taught. And my mom was widowed twice in China, so my siblings were all full-blooded Chinese from China. So I grew up in an entirely Chinese household with me and my dad being the, the foreigners that didn't speak and didn't get the language. I spent every weekend of my childhood across 101 in Chinatown, you know? And that's where I spent my childhood saying, can we get McDonald's on the way home? And that was, that was my deal, because I just didn't fit in. Um, so when I went to school and they said, you know, it's the story I tell, it's like, the first day of school, it's like, let's throw the Chinese guy in the trash can. I'm like, all right, cool. You know, because I'm not recognizing that's me. So I'm selfishly making works that, that I wish I had as a kid. And that's what started me doing it. It's like I thought of the Hopper Project when I was like seven years old, thinking maybe there'd be someone else that's dealing with this. I didn't think I'd make a book about it or do a museum show, but it was about trying to find someone else that was going through stuff like me because I had never experienced that. Now people can find their troops wherever they are because they can go online. But back then it just wasn't the case. So I think we do seek out people that are similar and, and you know, similar to Jamie living in Hawaii was the first time we're like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, and it's not just all great. It's also, I, I'm not special either. You know, because right, right. that's also part of being up. It's like, oh, all of a sudden, like, oh, I'm not, I don't get special treatment. No, because you're just like everyone else. So. Yeah, you just look for the crowd that's not going to beat you up. Yeah. <laughs> Any other things? And it, it, it sounds like I was more strident in high school, but I also struggled and at times were really embarrassed because my, my, my friends' dads were all like doctors and lawyers and engineers, and my dad ran a Chinese restaurant and had, you know, his hands were all gnarled and burned and scarred. And, and, there's times where you sort of look at it and like, why am I different? And, and does, what does that mean for me? And so it's just a sort of bumpy journey. It's, it's difficult enough when you're a kid trying to figure out who you are, but you add in uh, ethnicity or uh, you know, a, a, a gender orientation that, that some people don't approve of. Um, and then you know, it's, it becomes precarious. You know, the interesting thing for me, there was another dimension. We were the only people of Asian descent in my town. So we were the Asian faction. We were the, what, what, what they called us the international community. <laughs> but the, the desire was, just thinking back on this, and your question really prompted this, the desire was, as kids will do, you, you want to be able to fit in, right? And our mothers would say to us, American success with Japanese values. Go out the door, but Japanese values, right? She goes, be successful, she said, but Japanese values. So we would go out and you'd want to, there was a desire, particularly on those who were Afro-Japanese, to say, okay, we want to be able to fit in with the African-American community and, and be able to understand that culture and support that culture. And then also in the greater uh, white American community to have that success, right? It was very hard until about the fifth or sixth grade because kind of like the movie Stand and Deliver, when all the half Japanese kids took the standardized math test, the school district got together because they didn't understand how these immigrants' children would score higher than the American kids. So they made us take the tests again, right? Uh, which we did and which we still outscored. And then in the sixth grade, I won the county spelling bee and the teachers and principals from many schools came together and played the recording of my winning over and over again because they were absolutely sure that an immigrant's daughter could not spell that American word. So there was always this thing to want to fit in. And actually, by the sixth grade, I had all the groups supporting me, the white American students, the African American students, it was everything. But we were definitely the international community trying to find a place from between the lines to, to uh, I don't know what the word is, to, to just to be accepted with, by the other communities in existence there. And they were largely, it was a German, Irish, American town, a small African American community, and, uh, and then the international community. And it wasn't just a half Asian international community. There were also German women, French women, Italian women, Austrian, down the line because the a military base was two miles away. So, and in fact, st still today with a lot of my friends who are uh, African American, and let's say German or part Italian, they are absolutely amazed that Prince Harry has uh, married a biracial black white woman, although she's only called biracial in the UK. Her mother is visibly black, but she's only biracial. <laughs> Anyone else? You got one up there, Liz? Well, one of the first thank you uh, for doing this. Um, 
wanted to thank Kip especially uh, for sort of promoting the HAPA world, sort of word. Um, I, I just saw the exhibit um, and it was great to see uh, all these HAPAs together. Um, so uh, my question for you, you all three of you, is um, where do you see the HAPA identity going? Uh, there's sort of the issue of, you know, HAPAs are not created by other HAPAs. A lot of us are, you know, children of, you know, white fathers or Asian fathers. Um, and, um, you know, uh, if it sounded like, you know, all, all, all of you had a crisis in childhood or, or at least different times where you, where you felt like you didn't fit in, um, but then sort of found a little bit more identity within the HAPA sphere. Um, but how do we maintain that uh, going forward? Uh, you know, if HAPAs are not, you know, marrying other HAPAs, like wh wh where does this go? Um, I'll show you too. PJ Jack, come here. <laughs> come down, come down. What do you want to say? So this is my little Chinese blondie. Pepper is five. Um, and I would say probably in Santa Barbara, no one recognizes that she's Chinese, but in Hawaii, everyone knows that she's Hapa, without question, right? You know, it's not even a thing, you know? Jack is nine, um, no one thinks. Uh, when Jack was born, he was very uh, ethnically Chinese looking, and then my, uh, my ex-partner, Heather, uh, she's Scotch-Irish with orange, you know, orange red hair, and people would ask her uh, what agency she adopted him from, because he looked like a Chinese baby. Um, and so that's just what happened, but I, mean, I just don't even talk to these guys about it and like their class is fully mixed and that's Santa Barbara, which is, you know, not the most diverse place in the world. Um, but it's like, that's why I show at, at Janum. It's why I have such an affiliation with the JA community. They, they understand that, you know, Nikkei are mixed. They have to, whereas like I've been making art for 30 years. I've, I think I've shown at one Chinese American organization that was in New York. I've never had one ask me. People say, why? I go, because Chinese are... So there's so much, like Chinese is just, a, it's just monolith, but it's like Shanghai people hate people from Beijing and people from Canton hate the mainlanders and the, and the Viet Ching and you know, they, they hate the Brazilian Chinese and it's like, oh, they can't even deal with me. So, but that's, that's my answer is these two guys. So thank you guys. You can go play more electronic babysitting. Good dad. <laughs> <laughs> I think eventually it just won't matter. You know, I think, like, like, like you see, go, goes to school and everyone's, you know, at, at one point, New York City was, you know, Irish and Italian and, and British, and, and now it doesn't quite matter. Um, and in Hawaii, you know, every, you just kind of assume everyone's a little bit of everything. And uh, it's not that everyone, you know, doesn't make fun of other people, but they're, they're you know, aside from you know Native Hawaiians who had their you know their 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 land robbed from strip, you know stripped from them, um, the people that are there now, by and large, you know they can kind of make fun of each other in a gentle way because no one has a, a power dynamic that's you know demonstratively over another group, and eventually. You know, it'll, it's all going to sort of blend together. You know, I, I really want to write a short story or a novella set around, you know, 2042 when, when the Caucasians are supposed to be sort of the slipping into the minority and have like, you know, a, a story of two, you know, Asian parents adopting you know, a, a white child <laughs> and in, introducing this child to things of his culture, you know, like these are baked goods, like it's a birthday cake. I mean, <laughs> This is, this is, this is, here's, here's this is, this is meatloaf, you know, um, but just you know, whether it's satire or not. But I think it's, I think it's be really interesting when it, it, it isn't as divisive and it's more celebrated of just, uh, we're all a mix of something. That's awesome. This is hockey. It's like this. <laughs> yeah. See, the funny thing that Jamie talks about in, in Hawaii is like, I shot for the Opera Project twice. For the first series I shot, in 2004 or so, and then I shot last year in Hawaii. I shot eight shoots in LA and everyone filled up within half an hour. I'd announce it, the slots would fill, 60 slots would fill in half an hour. And I shot eight times, I could have shot eight more. There was a line of people saying, I've been waiting to do this forever. I shot one day in Hawaii and it didn't fill. No one, and that's, and the reason is because everyone's hapa. It's like going to a college campus saying, who's got a backpack? Anyone have a backpack here? Who's got a backpack? <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like no one cares. It's like everyone, it's just not an issue. And that was kind of like humbling and freeing at the same time. Lena? Yeah, I, one of the things I love about Hawaii is that everyone asks me for directions instead of saying, what are you? And that's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and I lived there for seven years, so I just tell them and I don't explain. Okay, and it's so nice to not explain. I mean, I think, you know, to your question that uh, I think that every ethnic group uh, faces that notion of, you know, what, what will happen to us in the future. Uh, for example, and... Uh, Duncan Williams, who's the director of the USC Shinso Ito Center for Japanese Religions and Culture, uh, has talked about uh, the fact that uh, over the next you know, five to eight years, the Japanese American community will become the first Asian American community that is majority mixed race. And that is because Japanese Americans have a 68% outmarriage rate. So if 68% of your population is marrying somebody else, and then they have on the average of two kids, then suddenly the notion of what is a Japanese American evolves because of that intermarriage. Same thing in the Hapa community. I mean, I think that there's, you know, a lot of, I mean, some of my friends say, you know, I have Kwapa kids, because they're, you know, you hear that term a lot. And I just think, I mean, I have a 32-year-old son, Kiyoshi. He was, you know, president of, um, of Hapa SC, now called Mixed SC. Matthew, wherever you are, okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, Matthew is one of the officers of Mixed SC, which is a mixed race group at USC, and talking about evolution, it used to be just a Hoppe group, but now there are so many mixed kids of so many different backgrounds that the students have changed the name to Mixed SC, and, you know, it moves forward, but with all of these people marrying out, I mean, I think with Kiyoshi, he was president of that organization, he was president of the Southern California uh, Greek uh, society, which covered 17 university campuses, and here you have this, you know, Afro-Japanese person in charge of it, um, and he has sort of embodied all of that kind of hop identity. His fiance is Vietnamese, so they'll have children that are Vietnamese, Japanese, Black, British, Cuban, just a whole yeah, and Native American. So they'll be, you know, so I think that there'll be lots of different versions of whatever that identity is. But I think going to what Jamie said, that we hope in the future, we hope, and maybe that's like hoping that Hollywood will will tame itself. But we, we hope that you know that borders will dissolve as intermarriage continues and and people are able to see across lines. And it's not even just intermarriage that's the solution. It's also you know who you have as neighbors or who you work with as we learn to either tolerate or hopefully embrace people who, uh, you know, are different. I mean, so, I mean, I know with my, my husband's family in Northern England, you know, that once we got married, my interactions with them changed how they look at the world, changed how he looks at the world. And uh, I think that's going to happen to Queen Elizabeth, too, when she has some <laughs> new great-grandkids soon. So. But, but just look at how much the attitude changed from gay marriage in the last 10 years. I mean, it's just, it's, it's astronomical. I would never have imagined this. I remember being in England, like, in the 90s, and someone asked me if we'd ever have a black president. I said, not in my lifetime. That's what I actually believed. I didn't think it would ever happen. It's just like, and it, you, so you think of, like, how much, like, you ask anyone of my kids, they don't even think about, like, why couldn't a man wear a man? They don't even think about it. It's not even a question. And I think it's really interesting that my kids don't really talk about race and this. They don't even think about it. I never talk about it with them. So let's hope that continues. Fingers crossed. Anything else, Liz? Oh. Any questions on this side before I head back over there? <laughs> I don't think I'd make you work for it, Liz. Oh, man. OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me bring it to you. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. My workout for the day. <laughs> Hello, I'm half Chinese, half Caucasian, and I was recently in West Virginia. I think you know the story. And I had this kid who was born and raised from West Virginia see my name tag, which said Catherine Fong. And this kid goes, Fong, what kind of last name is that? And I'm like, oh, it's one of the most common Chinese last names. And he goes, I've met two Chinese people in my life and one Mexican girl. And I was just wondering, how do you deal with people that like aren't first off used to like anybody that's different than them, and second off someone who's of mixed race? I want to fill that one. <laughs> Go, Jamie. Uh, how, how do you how do you how do you address these people or interact with them or move them along or? Uh, <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I, again, we, we, we naturally self-segregate. 
it's weird. We do it on Facebook. Um, we don't want to admit it, but we do. Um, you unfriend the douchebags, and you friend people you like, and it's we kind of do that. Um, in in general, I, I I'm just like it's cool. He met you. His world just got seismically different. And for some people, it's just little bits of like that. I, I, th I think about like food. If you had to eat one type of food your whole life, that would be kind of boring. But y we, get to, we get to partake of different cultures through what we consume, literally, or what we consume as far as entertainment. And I, I love art because art is cross-cultural. Um, you know, there are bands here that will be very popular in Japan or very popular in Brazil. And, it, and, it, and, and I, I, I believe that that's unstoppable. Uh, it's, it's weird that, I always, sometimes if you just think of it in the abstract, it's weird that we live in this culture where like, here's a border and everyone on this side is brown and, and everyone on this side is less brown because of this line that some map maker bought and sold this piece of property 200 years ago. And that's, you know, there's a move to go back and, and keep those, those lines even stronger. But I, I just think people will fall in love and befriend who they like. And it eventually, it will happen. And people like that, sometimes someone, it's not that they're unenlightened or limited in their perspective. Sometimes it's just uh, economics. I mean, there, I meet, I, I knew someone in Hawaii who had never left Hawaii. He lived there for like 32 years, had never left. Just he just didn't have the means to fly to someplace else and not really the desire to. And so, you know, some people are, are just different. And, and I think um, sometimes people knock certain museums for being identity museums or cultural museums. But those are opportunities for a whole grade school class of you know, fourth graders to come and to go to the Museum of the New South in, in Charlotte and learn of a different culture if they lived in a more monetized neighborhood. Um, and I think those things are helpful. The people that don't see the value in those, um, they don't get it. And they may never get it, but the next generation, I think, will. Where, where do you live? Oh, in Los Angeles, somebody said that? Oh, no, I was in, I was, oh, I was at an astrophysics camp in West Virginia. Okay. And this was a kid from rural West Virginia. I mean, I have to say, there is something about living in, in Los Angeles or New York and certain urban centers in this country where we come to think of U.S. society in a certain way. But having grown up in Kansas, I can tell you that there's a huge swath of the country between New York City and L.A. <laughs> that is very different and that does not think that way. And, and so I can, I can see where you might have that kind of experience, but I'm with Jamie. I mean, as far as I'm, you can say to this person, well, well, your whole world became a lot more enlightened because you met me. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, when I go to astrophysics, it can't plus. Uh, <laughs> I think you got two things there. One is that it's, it's just a matter of that their attitude and the respect with which they approach you. I have no problem with the what are you question so long as the person is respectful about it and they're willing to answer it themselves. You know, if someone's going to go, like, oh, I'm on the street, then it's kind of offensive to me and I have a problem. But if they're going to have a conversation, it's fine. Uh, the second one is that uh, it's not your job to educate 24 7. You know, and that's sometimes we get that as activists. It's like you've got to do it all the time. Um, so my friend, it's like, if you don't pick your battles, you're always at war. I'm like, okay, so sometimes I just let those things go. You know, when someone's like, you know, someone drops the term oriental to me or someone's just like, sometimes I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to fight this right now. It's just not worth my time. But if that person was there and they meant well, you're the first person I met, and like, you may, well, you're the first person that's ever said that to me. You know, and they can like, oh, you can have a little learning moment. I usually try and keep my mouth shut, but I just got to, if the kid was positive, if he was jazzed in a good way that he met you, that's a good thing. You know? I mean, I, I, so many thoughts came up when you guys were talking. I don't, I should keep my mouth shut. But I just had to say it. At least he's being positive. So that's a yeah, good thing. If it's thing. done with respect, there's no problem. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I do look at those moments as if someone, because I live in Montana, and so people sometimes are like, what are you? And it's, and it's, a, it's an attempt at understanding. If, I, there's been times where people ask me, why do you live in Montana? And I'm like, you know, you could have asked that a nicer way. You know? <laughs> um, and so 
it's it's but if they're like wow why do you live in montana that's an attempt to build a to, to for a connective moment and so if someone's like wow what are you and i'm like well i'm this and this and my family has an interesting interesting story and it's it's an open door i do think sometimes it's it's stated clumsily but it's an attempt at understanding oh i'm sorry i wanted to say one thing um i was born in 1950 and i was in junior high and I kept staring at this guy in the science class because to me he looked like Elvis Presley. He was just so pretty. And I kept staring at him all through class and he was all across the room. And then I go pick up my books and I'm just in my own little world and all of a sudden he's in front of my face and with no emotion at all in his voice he said, what were you looking at? And because I'm stupid, I told him, I said, well, I, I just think you're the most beautiful boy I've ever seen in my whole life. And I don't think that's what he expected to hear. And he was half Japanese and half Irish. And he wound up being friends and getting to know each other. But it was like he was going to confront it because he couldn't stand it anymore. And I didn't know what he was talking about. You know? Yeah, but to him, you were probably the 50th person that, that's been staring at him. Yeah. So what a nice thing for him to hear that from you. So thank you for being and, honest. Uh, does that mean that Elvis Presley is Hoppe? <laughs> <laughs> in, in my first book, Hotel in the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, there's a, a character named Keiko Akabe. And people ask me, what, why did I name this character Keiko? And I tend to say, um, I, I like Star Trek and Chief O'Brien on Deep Space Nine. His wife is named Keiko. And that's kind of like my, my made up answer. The real answer is I had a dear friend years ago named Keiko Akabe. We worked together. We went to the Beastie Boys concert together. And I have not seen her in 22 years. And my Keiko is here. Wow. <laughs> Yay. We can't top that. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming. We'll see you guys outside. Thank you, Thank you Belinda. Thank you, Jamie.